Hi, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Workman, uh, and this is going to be your screencast session seven for the cellular basis of life unit. Uh, let's get started right away. As you go through this particular screencast, you should be able to explain why the semi permeable membrane is semi, semi permeable or selectively permeable. Well, in fact, you should already be, to, be able to explain that. And uh, you should already actually have a, a definition for passive transport. That's learning target two. But we're going to talk about uh, types, a couple of types of passive transport today. Uh, you should know what um, a concentration gradient is. You should be able to define that. And you should be able to explain and define what diffusion is and, you know, the process that it, that it is and uh, what's the overall ending result of diffusion. Um, you should be able to define what osmosis is, and uh, you should be able to uh, define and explain the difference between what we call a hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic solution. Uh, and of course, those will all be in comparison to cell cytoplasm. Uh, and number seven, you should be able to explain the effect of those three different types of solutions, uh, the effect that those solutions have on cells. So um, what we're going to do right now is look at this diagram, and what you should do is have your unit booklet out and... Uh, page number 116. Uh, we're going to write some notes on this diagram and what I want you to see on this diagram uh, right now in color is that these orange particles they represent molecules of dye and as we go uh, through time here I want you to see that these orange particles are moving over across this semi-permeable membrane as we call it here and at the end of it what we have is an equal amount or equal concentration and as you look at these diagrams in color, these purple molecules are moving to the right and the orange molecules are moving to the left as you progress through time until you have an equal uh, concentration on both sides. These diagrams are uh, depicting the process of diffusion. So let's write some notes about this on your diagram, uh, page 116 in your unit booklet, okay? So I'm going to go to the uh, digital document camera view here and pause this and, you know, Look at this as you need to, um, or slow this down as you need to so that you can write these notes. So right here what I have is a, a definition for diffusion. And the way I think about diffusion is really just the spread of particles through random motion uh, from regions of high concentration to or toward lower, lower concentration areas. And what you need to realize is that diffusion occurs as a result of um, ordered systems descending into chaos. That is the process of entropy. Um, and this is kind of hard to realize, but what you see here is that this situation is more organized than this situation. Here we have a clear concentration of material on the left side of this membrane as it is, and so we could refer to that as high concentration. And over here, we don't have a lot of concentration of these molecules that die. Now what this diagram is actually depicting here is these particles of dye molecules dissolved in water. And on this side of the membrane, there's a high concentration. And on this side of the mem membrane, there's, well, really no concentration. So of course it's lower concentration. And what we're seeing is that through the entropic process, and this is the second law of thermodynamics, um, particles diffuse toward areas of lower concentration. And oh, you know, this is diagram one, this is diagram two, and this is diagram three. What it's, and this is depicting what happens over time, that these concentrated particles would diffuse out until they're all evenly spread out. This idea of evenly spread out or all equal concentration everywhere, that's this idea of equilibrium, right? And, you know, when you have a difference in concentration on different sides of a membrane, what we call that is a gradient or a concentration gradient. So that's a key term here, concentration gradient. And what we have as a definition for concentration gradient is a difference in the concentration of a substance across adjacent areas. All right? If you think about yourselves when you are set up in class, students, you students are concentrated near the front of our rooms. But if Mr. Gales or, uh, you know, me, Mr. Workman, if we didn't keep you in that area, you guys would all spread out into a chaotic situation and you'd spread out throughout the room. But since we keep you in those ordered rows or in those ordered groups of four, um, 
in pods, what we can do is keep you concentrated in an area. But in the absence of that authority, in the absence of our energy to keep you guys concentrated in that area, you guys would all spread out and diffuse throughout the room. And this is what happens at the particulate level, the molecular level. Now in this diagram, what we see are two different molecules. If you remember the color diagram on the slide before, um, this is purple and this was kind of orange. And what you see is that this purple, these purple particles are diffusing to the right side of these squares over time, and the orange particles are diffusing across to the left side of the squares over time. And what that means at the end of this is we'd have equal concentration of both types of these particles on both sides of the membrane here. And the thing to understand about equilibrium is that it's not static. These particles, these orange particles, wouldn't necessarily stay over here and these orange particles wouldn't necessarily stay over here. I could get these particles still moving, but the same number of particles that move from left to right, the same number would move back from right to left. It's sort of like if I had one student enter the room in, through one of the doors into our room, and then another student exit the room through a different doorway into our room, and, um, you know, we'd have a change in the who, which students were in the room, but the total number of students would be consistent. That's dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic means change, but equi equilibrium means still the same. So we still have a change, but the overall uh, amount or concentration on both sides of this membrane is constant. All right, we're going to go back to this view, and what we are going to do is to talk about a particular type of diffusion, and that's called osmosis. All right? Oh, and a point I want to make about any type of diffusion here is that it doesn't require any energy. There is no energy required for diffusion. It just happens as a natural consequence of the second law of thermodynamics, that ordered systems tend to descend into chaos without the input of energy. Osmosis, if we're going to define diffusion of, uh, of uh, osmosis, it's, it's the diffusion of water. And water can diffuse through selectively permeable membranes. And the thing to know about osmosis is that water diffusion, osmosis, will keep going as long as there are differences in water concentration on opposite sides of a membrane. And when we have that concentration gradient of water, what we have is what we call osmotic pressure. So we're going to continue to get this water movement from high areas, high concentration areas of water to lower concentration of areas of water until there's equilibrium. And when there's equilibrium in water concentration, we refer to that as osmotic balance. So let's consider this. We've got this scenario here. And let's imagine that I could have a beaker. And in this beaker, uh, what I've got is this border that divides the beaker in two. And let's say it's a semi-permeable membrane. Well, most of what's in this beaker is water but these little red dots represent a dissolved solute. Maybe it's salt or maybe it's sugar. Um, and if you know anything about membrane permeability, um, dissolved ions or dissolved salts, or if molecules are too big, they can't cross the membrane. They can't go from one side to the other. But here's the thing about water. Semi-permeable membrane, um, cell membrane, is permeable to water. Water can cross the membrane according to concentration gradient relatively easily. Now, if let's say I put on this side of my beaker, on the left side of my beaker, I put 60 grams of water and 40 grams of salt. And on this side of my beaker, I put 90 grams of water and 10 grams of salt. The result is, is that I'd have a solution mixture, which percent by mass, 60% of which would be water over here on the left side, and 90% of which would be water on the right side. Now, you might think that these red dots, because the other diagram was indicating the dots can move according to the concentration gradient, but these red dots, as I've defined them here for you, are not permeable, or the membrane is not permeable to these red dots. But the membrane is permeable to the water. So what do you think is going to happen here? Well, the water is going to move. In which direction do you think it will move? Well this is the way it'll move. It'll move from the higher concentration area to the lower concentration area. Not the solute concentration, but the water concentration, right? So before, we had 90% concentration of water on the right, 
concentration of water on the left. And what will happen is water will move to where it's less concentrated or toward where it's less concentrated until we have this osmotic balance, which would be dynamic equilibrium for the water. This diagram we're going to talk about now, and that diagram is page 117 in your unit booklet, and we're going to, um, I'm going to go over some notes that I put on this diagram right now. So let me switch to the document camera feed. Oops, sorry, here we go. So first of all, as we look at this diagram, I want to define a couple of key terms here for you. And please recall that a solution is a mixture, generally a, a homogeneous mixture, of dissolved solute in a solvent. And for the purpose of this diagram, we're going to say that this solution is outside of the cell. All right? So when we're talking about a hypotonic solution or an isotonic solution or a hypertonic solution, this is in reference to or relative to the cytoplasm inside these cells. Now, just to make sure that you guys understand this, hypo, the prefix on that word means less. And the tonic part of this word refers to the solute amount or, to, or the dissolved solid, okay? So hypotonic means there's less solute in the solution outside of the cell. And that's in, in you know, relative to the cytoplasm concentration, okay? Now this is an animal cell. And what it's showing is that an animal cell could literally burst. We call this lysis when a cell bursts, okay? Um, an animal cell, if it's exposed to a hypotonic solution, could burst. A plant cell, on the other hand, because it's protected by the, its cell wall, would um, have water diffuse into it, but it fills up this large central vacuole, and that central vacuole would create internal turgor pressure inside of the cell, and that's what would be helpful to the plant to help it stand up and remain upright and grow well. So let's make sure we have some information here about a hypotonic solution. In a hypotonic solution outside the cell, what that means is it has a lower concentration of solutes, okay? It's a lower solute concentration. But what that means is that the water concentration outside the cell is higher. And because the water concentration outside the cell is higher, that would mean that the water would osmotically move into these cells. They would, the water diffuses into the cell. And that water diffusion is called osmosis. An example of a hypotonic solution relative to cell cytoplasm would be distilled water. Distilled water is water that's been boiled, and you recapture the steam, and what that does is it removes all the dissolved components out of the water. When we look at the middle part of this diagram, that's isotonic, iso, the iso prefix means the same. So what this means then is that we have a result, uh, uh, the result is dynamic equilibrium in both of these types of cells. As much water that diffuses into these cells or os osmotically moves into these cells, the same amount would move out of the cell. And so we'd still have water movement, but the amount of water moving in would be equal to the amount of water moving out. And so the result is the cell would not change shape, um, and it wouldn't really be um, affected much. Now, flaccid means that a water cell wouldn't be very, a, a, a whole lot of pressure. Excuse me, a plant cell wouldn't have a whole lot of internal turgor pressure in it. We actually want turgor pressure in a plant cell. We don't really want um, not too much pressure inside of a plant cell. When you think about an isotonic solution, here's what that effectively means. It means that the solution outside of the cell has an equal concentration of dissolved solutes, dissolved solids, as that means the solute, and water compared to the cytoplasm. Okay? Now, when we look at hypertonic, hyper means more. Okay? Now, do you remember what the tonic means? The tonic means the solute or dissolved solid, okay? So the result is if we have more dissolved solute outside the cell that's hypertonic, what that will mean is that the water will diffuse out of the cell. In an animal cell, that would be called, you know, that would shrivel up, or in a plant cell, we call that 
uh, plasmalized. The process is plasmolysis. So the process of plasmolysis, that's the process name, and the end result is a cell is plasmalized. The term crenation, C-R-E-N-A-T-I-O-N, -E is sometimes used uh, to explain the process of an animal cell becoming shriveled up. In a hypertonic solution, the solution outside the cell has a greater concentration of dissolved solutes, dissolved solids, which is the solute, and therefore uh, a lower concentration of water outside the cell compared to the cytoplasm of the cell. So the result is there's a higher concentration of water inside the cells than there is outside the cells, and so the water moves out. Back to our slides here for a second. And what I want you to think about is this. Let's say we had a cell that had 80% water cytoplasm, and so 20% dissolved solids inside the cytoplasm, and it's exposed to distilled water, 100% water. There's going to be some osmosis here. In what direction would the osmosis be? Well, water would move into the cell, okay? This would be a hypotonic solution scenario. This would create turgor pressure inside the, a plant cell, and it could cause lysis in an animal cell. How about this? What's this? 90% water and 90% water inside and outside. What's this scenario? Well, this is, means we have equal amounts of water going into the cell, as we have amount of water coming out of the cell. This would be an isotonic situation. So we have dynamic equilibrium in this scenario. How about this? Let's say we got 90% water inside of a cell, which means 10% dissolved solutes inside the cytoplasm of the cell, and 75% water outside the cell, which means this would be like cells inside of uh, a salty, briny solution. I don't know if you've ever helped your mom or dad prepare a turkey before a big meal, a big holiday meal, Thanksgiving, or what have you, um, a common thing to do is to put a turkey in brine, which is a really, really high salt concentration solution. Well, if you do that, what happens is water moves out of the cells, all right? And we would call that exposing it to a hypertonic solution. So in animal cells, we get that shriveling, and in plant cells, we get that plasmolysis. These cells would be considered plasmalized. Okay? Now, this is a YouTube. Ha ha ha, right? It's actually, we used to use these back in the day, and you can create a tube that's in the shape of a U, and what you can do is put a semi-permeable membrane at the bottom of the U, and you can actually watch this happen. If I added a whole bunch of salt to this side, what would happen is the water would move from this side over to this side. And if you get enough salt and a good semi-permeable membrane at the bottom of your U-tube, you can actually watch the water over time move to the right side of this U-tube. It's actually a pretty cool thing that, that I did once in college. This diagram is page 118 in your unit booklet. So let's move to the uh, camera feed here and describe to you what's happening here. This is uh, a diagram that's depicting what we call facilitated diffusion. So for example, if these were particles that were charged ions, and this is something that normally couldn't get through the phospholipid bilayer because of its charge or maybe because of its size, what we do have in the phospholipid bilayer, the fluid mosaic cell membrane model, we do have these embedded integral proteins. And what you're seeing here are a couple of different um, processes whereby proteins can facilitate diffusion. So this would be a high concentration of solutes out here and a lower concentration of solutes inside the cell. So we have this diffusion process, but the problem is, is whatever these particles are depicted by this diagram, they can't get through the phospholipid bilayer. But they should be able to get through, or they can get through, special proteins like this channel protein or this other protein which makes a conformational, which means a shape change, uh, when it's exposed to whatever this particle is. This particle might um, cause this protein to let it through into the cell. So these proteins facilitate the diffusion. That is, they make it easier than it otherwise would be. And so what you're seeing here are channel proteins that allow passage of materials across membrane that otherwise could not cross that phospholipid bilayer.
And the reason for that inability to cross would potentially be because of a charged ion situation or maybe even the size of the particle. <clears throat> so that's it. Um, Mr. Gales is going to talk about uh, this particular process, which is ion transfer, uh, which is an active transport process. But we talked about facilitated diffusion, which is a passive transport process. We talked about water diffusion, which is osmosis, which is a passive transport process. We talked about what happens to cells when they're exposed to hypertonic solutions. We talked about what happens to cells when they're exposed to isotonic solutions. And we talked about what happens to cells when they're exposed to hypotonic solutions. We went through this diagram that was on page 117. We talked about these scenarios, about what happens, uh, when os why, and why osmosis happens, what it is, and we talked about this diagram, which is just introducing you to the concept of diffusion and concentration gradients. So hopefully you can um, hit these targets now, and that's it for now, ladies and gentlemen. Take care.